Welcome to the Market Front Lines. I'm Lindsay Melchuk. Up next with us is a conversation that's centered on a company redefining North America's path towards energy independence, First Phosphate Corp. Now, while others are still scrambling to understand how China's export controls have shifted the playing field, First Phosphate has been very quietly and yet very deliberately positioning itself as a powerhouse in the LFP battery ecosystem. From securing critical mineral supply to attracting international investors, this company isn't just reacting to global events, it's full force driving them. And now joining me today is the man at the center of all of it, John Pasalacqua, CEO of First Phosphate. John's leadership has guided the company through a string of game-changing moves that have caught the attention of both policymakers and investors worldwide. Um, Welcome, John. Welcome to the show. I can't wait to learn more here. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. That was such a brilliant introduction. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So right out of the gate here, John, First Phosphate has found itself in the spotlight lately following China's export restrictions on LFP technology. Now, these controls have exposed just how vulnerable global supply chains really are and just how valuable First Phosphate's position is in North America. So what's happening behind the scenes right now that investors might not fully grasp about? And how is this shift changing the trajectory of your company? Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. So I do think that the investors are really starting to grasp it. Um, you know, and also I think it's important to understand, you know, it's not what's happening behind the scenes right now, but it's what's been happening for the past three years. In many ways, uh, First Phosphate has, you know, been planning for this day, not that that we want it to happen. We want all countries in the world to, to be harmonious together. But we had a feeling that, you know, either way that it went, whether it, uh, relationships improved around the world or they didn't, we thought that kind of com- companies and countries w- would want to have their independent secured supply chain. So that's what we've been building since the beginning, a fully functional LFP, lithium iron phosphate battery supply chain end to end that starts with the mine and ends with with the battery. Now, obviously, you know, we have partners along the, the way. And as we get further away from the mine, it's it's less us and it's more partners and we're perhaps not involved in, in, in all the trajectories. But at least that piece that goes from the mine that is the the phosphate, the, the critical mineral that goes into LFP battery, phosphate being, you know, probably the biggest choke point, even larger than the lithium, um, and then transforming that into uh, purified phosphoric acid and transforming that into LFP powder, LFP cathode active material that then goes into batteries and then they, that then goes into, you know, um, all kinds of uh, drones or uh, energy storage devices, data centers, uh, uh, electric vehicles, small electrical devices, whatever it may be. Well, that leads directly to something historic you recently accomplished. Now, you have been create you actually created the very first LFP battery cells that's made entirely from North American critical minerals. And two of those minerals, phosphate and iron, came straight from your own property. That's that's not just a milestone, John. That's a serious message. So what does this achievement signal for North America's ability to control its own energy future? And do you see this reshaping investor confidence in the sector? Yeah, I think you really nailed it there, Lindsay. And thank you for taking the time and understanding all that. So, you know, what, what we have here are the first um, LFP battery cells that have been produced using North American critical minerals. Um, so as you know, LFP technology was invented um, in the United States and Canada around the year 2001. Um, not too much production happened at that time. And then it was quickly uh, moved or, or whatever you want to call it, went over to China. And it's all been made in China. All the all the LFP cathode active material, mo- most of these cells uh, right now, 100% pretty much are made in China. So it was all about, you know, proving the concept that we can do this. We can do this in North America. And not only did we make these battery cells with um, the critical minerals, like you said, two of four of which were from our properties, the phosphate and the iron, the graphite coming from uh, Nouveau Monde uh, graphite in uh, in Montreal, and the lithium coming from uh, Century Lithium in Nevada. And the company that, that assembled them was from Nevada as well, Altian. Um, but not only that, but when these batteries were tested, there was only 150 of them made, so it was a small commercial uh, production they they cycled uh, um, two thousand times, which is a standard commercial tra- test, and they they held their charges um, all the time throughout those uh, uh, those cycles. So it means that this is uh, tested at commercial grade. So meaning that all the critical minerals that are in here, all the four that we just discussed, um, are fu- fully um, validated within the supply chain. So if we were able to do this in large scale. Um, it would be perfect. We'd be able to get the batteries. Now batteries are different, right? There's different sizes, um, but um, we'd be able to get the batteries that that 
that that could fully uh, localize the LFP battery supply chain in North America. Because right now, companies are importing these batteries and building products around them. They say that these products are made in North America, and they sure are. But the heart of it, right, the battery is not. It's coming from China, and it's a critical flaw because China has even identified this. People don't catch on to this when when they when they when they, when China says, "Hey, we're banning rare earths, we're banning exports of semiconductors, and we're also banning LFP technology." Well, they latch on immediately to the rare earths and to the semiconductors, and we see a lot of movements in those stock prices. But LFP, there's only very few companies that deal in LFP in North America. And there's only one company, as far as I know, that deals in LFP from the mine all the way to the finished product, and that's First Phosphate. That is a brilliant, brilliant uh, explanation. Thank you, that. Now, John, speaking of confidence, the Minister of Mines of Canada recently visited your installation at one of your projects. Now, that's a, that's a major nod from Ottawa. John, I mean, it's not every day we'll say a mining minister just shows up on site. So what does this visit really mean for the company? Was it symbolic? Was it um, or is it maybe the start of something bigger in terms of federal collaboration or potential support? I mean, look, I mean, first of all, I don't being able to produce this. We're the only company in North America that has been able to do this from uh, North America and critical minerals and being a Canadian company. Um, it's a real pride for, for Canada. And so it's, you know, I, I would assume it's, it, you know, part of the visit was, was due to that and just the acknowledgement of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, also, we met, we met the minister at the port of Saguenay, Saguenay uh, being just two hours North of Quebec city. It's a deep sea port. That port is 70 kilometers from our property, the Beijing La Marche property, which is where uh, the phosphate will be mined. But at Port Saguenay is where we'll, we will be doing the secondary transformation, and that is turning that phosphate uh, uh, powder into uh, phosphoric acid, which then goes into batteries. So the Port of Saguenay is a very strategic point, not only for us, but also for the federal government. Um, if you've been reading lately, um, there's a big, big sort of push in Canada, right, to build our, our infrastructure, our critical minerals, our supply chains, and our, and our, and our uh, logistics routes. So there's a, there's a proposed plan to open up the Ring of Fire in Ontario, which is an area with a lot of critical minerals, and transport those minerals across northern Ontario, northern Quebec, and bingo, to uh, get them to port at the port of Saguenay. So that's uh, part of why the reason that the minister was out there. But also what's really important is First Phosphate uh, occupies um, the foremost uh, uh, position at the port of Saguenay in relation to the port for its secondary processing facilities. There's about eight to 11 kilometers of, of uh, square kilometers of, of open land uh, for industrial development at the port of Saguenay. And we occupy one of the best spots there uh, to deliver our phosphate concentrate and phosphoric acid to our off takers in Europe, but also to be able to process and to be able to deliver to end clients in the United States. John, you are trailblazing for sure. Now, I recently broke down the new Quebec Mining Law, Bill 63. Why don't you give us your synopsis on that and how that's affecting your company? Bill 63, maybe you can remind me because there's so many bills out there. <laughs> Which one is that one in particular? So it, it has to do with land uh, exploration. It has to do with uh, Indigenous uh, involvement. It has to do with a bunch of different things and how you know, there are new rules in place that, you know, what you dig, you have to clean up. You can't pass that on to the next generation. You have to actually be doing the work for 90% of what you say you're going to be doing. You have to be actually including the Indigenous communities in the table of decision making at this point. And, if, and you have to actually be, there is, uh, the government can come in and say any of your tailings nowadays you may have to be able, you may be able to mine those. And if you don't, on any of those things, your claims could be taken away, um, your rights could be taken away, and your project shut down. So uh, what's your takeaway on all of that? I mean, how are you incorporating all of those new things into your projects? So I think that's the bill that you're talking about, I think just came out about six months ago. Uh, it's funny because uh, we started uh, First Phosphate probably about two and a half years ago. And uh Almost everything that's in, in that new law is what First Phosphate had actually pioneered. I'm not saying that they caught it from us. Maybe they did. Some people say they have. But the first thing we did is when we came into Saguenay, Lake St. John's, we sat down with the local uh, Chamber of Commerce. We sat down with the uh, industrial associations in the area. We sat down with the indigenous groups. 
Um, and because there's a lot of phosphate in the area, but we wanted to know where was the best area to be able to go and mine. And we wanted to be able to understand that, you know, it's going to, there's going to be lo local social acceptability around it. So we did all that. So basically what that law says is that before you do any drilling, you have to consult all these communities. We went out and we started consulting these communities since the beginning. Some people said, what are you doing? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So you're, you're mining backwards. You figure out first where your mine is and it's a geological thing and it's where God puts it. And then after that, only then after that, do you go and, uh, and, you know, meet with people. I said, no, how, how can you do that? Why would I want to put any money into drilling somewhere where somebody doesn't want me to be drilling? So we did do it, you know, backwards, but now that seems to be forwards. Um, but also what, also what, what ends up coming out of that, Lindsay, is that um, they don't want uh, um, mining companies taking claims on private lands unless they have um, um, authorization from, um, from some of the, uh, from, from the landowners. So what this is going to do, uh, I mean, it restricts, a, it's going to restrict a lot of mining in Quebec. And also you cannot, uh, go out and, and start drilling until you have consent from, from in, indigenous groups. So before you could just go out and drill, but now you can't drill without the indigenous groups. So we've had an indigenous collaboration agreement for about a year and a half. And that's been a great thing because, um, a lot of, a lot of these, uh, permits and a lot of the steps as we develop towards a mine will have to, um, have an indigenous, uh, consultation and consent. So the fact that we have a collaboration agreement in, in together with our Indigenous group makes us go a lot faster. Um, so, and a lot of this is really, you know, it's uh, some of it I think has gone perhaps a little bit too far, um, but, you know, it is what it is, but it sets also a big barrier to entry to new companies. We have our, our land claims staked. We have our land uh, ready to go. Um, we have, you know, consent from the local Indigenous group, from the local municipalities. We have, you know, letters of of acceptance from the municipalities, chambers of commerce. We, we've we've done all that. Um, so this is uh, really helpful for us um, because it's a big barrier to entry to a lot of other companies. Well, let's transition from policy to performance. You've raised $20 million in financing in just six months, John, a strong sign of institutional and retail confidence in what you're building. What kind of conversations are you having with investors behind closed doors right now? Are they starting to understand the scale of what First Phosphate represents in the clean energy supply chain? Or are you still feeling like the market is undervaluing your momentum? A good question, Lindsay. I guess every CEO would always say that they're undervalued, but we kind of just realize you got to kind of just go with the flow. So we've raised forty million dollars in the last uh, three and a half years, and we raised that completely on our own, without any investment banks, all non-brokered private placements by the management team. And like you said, in the last uh, five to six months, it's been twenty million. Um, so yeah, where, where there has been maybe lack of understanding from investment banks and research analysts, and you know whatever structural flaws there are in the investment banking system. We've been able to culminate that with with you know our investors and direct discussions with you know family offices, high net worth individuals, families and friends. Um, it's really uh, you know I call it our shareholder family, and the reason I call it that is because I literally know the whole book. Anybody who's who's bought into a, one of our placements, I know probably about oh gosh ninety five to ninety eight percent. And the ones that I don't know, it's because a broker who brought in ten people that I know that broker and maybe five or six of those people and not their you know their 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 cousins or or their daughters or sons, but. Um, we know everybody in, in our deal um, because we've had to build it during a very difficult market. Uh, we just wouldn't give up. The last three and a half years, we had this vision. We knew that one day this was going to be prime LFP battery and LFP battery local supply chain would be at the top of the news headlines. And we didn't know when that day would be, but we just had to build, build, build for when that happened. And sure enough, um, it has manifested now. And uh, those who understood us earlier are doing really well with their investment. Well, I mean, John, your your family is also expanding. Your reach into Europe is gaining some serious traction right now. You've secured a long-term offtake agreement, volumes are ramping up, and you've just been listed on TradeGate. That's a lot of international attention for a company still considered emerging by many people. So how are you leveraging that European demand strategically, and what should investors be watching for next as you expand globally? Yeah, no, it, it's it, it's great. I mean, uh, we consider Europe our our our, our backyard. I mean, uh, our offtake agreements are with uh, you know uh, a large uh, European offtaker. Um, we, you know, we're a fully bilingual company, uh, English and French, because we operate in uh, in in Quebec. Also, the phosphate market, just so you know, is is a very francophone kind of market. It has a lot. It's been very developed in in France and Morocco and a lot of the French speaking countries. 
Um, so phosphate is a very European kind of uh, subject matter. And also Europe has no phosphate um, within its borders. And it's a big problem for critical and uh, strategic mineral access. Other than a couple small mines in northern Finland, um, you know, Mor- uh, Morocco and, uh, and Russia being the larger players. And now obviously with, with Russia and the sanctions, it's a problem. But uh, Europe seems to be very, very attuned uh, to phosphate, phosphorus, and, and anything to do with it. So it's just been naturally a really, really good market for us. And even in Frankfurt, we've always been very well received. And, uh, you know, our volume, volume on our ticker symbol, um, a KD0, uh, started to expand on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And we were recently listed by TradeGate as well, which is a good sign of, of, of volume as well. So very, very fortunate for our European investors. We, we love them dearly. And we're going to start doing a little bit more uh, outreach in the European market. Well, I mean, we have a large audience out there from the European market, so market, so a big nod to them. Keep it going. Keep that momentum going here for First Phosphate. Now, this is a conversation that has been so jam-packed with knowledge and insights. John, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to having you come back and update us further. Oh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Really appreciate it. Again, that was John Pasolacqua, CEO of First Phosphate Corp, trading on the CSE under PHOS and on the OTCQX under FRSPF. You can learn more about their groundbreaking work in reshaping the North American LFP supply chain by visiting firstphosphate.com. I'm Lindsay Melchuk with Appaton Media, and this is the Market Frontlines, where the future of capital meets the courage to build it. We'll see you soon. 